Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wavy Leaf Basket webinar with the Natural Areas Association. I'm just going to wait a few more seconds um, while folks log in. Um, and in the meantime, I will start a little introduction to the webinar. So um, my name is Sarah Pierce. I'm the program assistant here at the Natural Areas Association. Um, just some uh, webinar logistics. There will be a question and answer period uh, at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Please use the chat function to type in your questions during uh, the presentation. You can test that, that chat function now by typing in which state you're logging in from and whether or not you've seen wavy leaf basket grass um, in your area. Um, I'll also note that the Society of American Foresters has approved this webinar for one continuing forestry education credit. It's a category one credit. Please email me at s-p-e-a-r-s -S -S at naturalareas.org with your state license or registration number so that I can arrange for you to receive credit from SAF if you're interested. I'll now say a little bit about the Natural Areas Association, highlight our upcoming events, and then hand the webinar over to Dr. Vanessa Beecham, who's with us today to talk about wavy leaf basket grass. So the Natural Areas Association is the organization that connects, supports, educates, and advocates for the national community of natural areas professionals. NAA is a 501c3, we're over 40 years old, we provide up-to-date scientific information for natural areas management through webinars, the Natural Areas Journal, which is a quarterly peer-reviewed uh, publication, regional workshops, and our annual Natural Areas Conference. I encourage you to visit naturalareas.org or connect with a colleague who is a member of NAA to learn more about us. So, we have, a, we have an annual uh, conference, the Natural Areas Conference. Next year will be in Reno, Nevada, and we are in the process of opening up uh, the call for proposals for that conference. So keep an eye on our website for that. We'll be in Duluth, Minnesota the following year, 2021, um, and we are beginning to form up the program for that conference as well. You can find more information about these events, other events, um, archives of past webinars at our website, naturalareas.org. So we have Dr. Vanessa Beecham from uh, Towson, Towson State University with us today. She's an associate professor of biological sciences and she teaches classes in ecology and evolution, botany and wetland ecology. Her research focuses on invasive species, urban forest succession, effects of deer browse on ecosystem processes, and e ecology of streamside plant communities. Her work includes practical applications related to management, conservation, and restoration of plant communities. Vanessa, go ahead and share your PowerPoint. Well, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here to share what my lab's been working with over about the last probably nine or 10 years or so on wavy leaf basket grass. And so this will go through kind of what it looks like, a little bit about the ecology that we know about, and then we'll end up talking about um, some controls and next steps. So what we know about wavy leaf basket grass. Um, so the really critical thing, first of all, is to be able to identify it. So I was watching the comments um, as they went by at the bottom of the screen here while people were logging in, and a lot of you haven't seen it yet. Um, so being able to identify it really quickly if you get it and take care of it is really important. So it looks like a lot of other, a couple of other um, fairly common grasses. So wavy leaf basket grass is up here in the top left and it has these kind of characteristically crinkly leaves. So that's one of the things that you look for. Um, I've also got it here compared with uh, Japanese silk grass and their deer tongue. And I'll show you some closer examples of that. So here's Japanese silk grass on the left and wavy leaf on the right. Um, what you look for is silk grass is going to have this silvery mid vein down the middle of the leaf, um, whereas wavy leaf won't have that. Um, wavy leaf, like I said, has these undulating leaves and it's also fairly fuzzy along the stem and on the leaves and silk grass won't have that. So that's a good way to tell them apart. 
This next one's a little trickier. This is um, deer tongue grass or Dicanthelium cladistinum. Um, deer tongue tends to be a lot bigger than wavy leaf, but it can have kind of ripply leaves, um, so it confuses people sometimes. One of the things you look for is the leaf um, will wrap around the stem in deer tongue, and in wavy leaf it just comes up and touches the stem. Um, so that's another, that's a way to tell them apart. Um, deer tongue also doesn't really have the ripply leaves like wavy leaf does, so those are some of the things you look for. Probably the easiest thing to confuse it with is Arthrox and hispidus, or small carpet grass or hairy joint grass, which is another exotic species, at least in my area of Maryland. Um, this one's a lot harder because it tends to have kind of ripple, ripply leaves. It does have a fuzzy stem. Um, when they're young, they look really similar. I've been fooled in the field by this before. So I watch this all the time. I still get fooled. Again, what you're looking for is with hairy joint grass, just like the deer tongue, the leaf will wrap around the base of the stem, whereas in wavy leaf it doesn't do that. It just comes up and touches the stem. So that's the characteristic you look for if you're trying to decide if you've got hairy joint grass or wavy leaf basket grass. Um, and if people have it or think they have it and they want a verification, I'm happy for people to email me photos and I can look and let you know if you've got it or not. Um, so a little introduction about kind of the history of the invasion and what we know about the grass. So this was first discovered in Maryland in Patapsco Valley Park, Patapsco Valley State Park and near Liberty Reservoir in 1996. And it actually took them quite a while to figure out what they had. It had to go all the way to the Smithsonian. It got sent out to an expert in Germany. And I finally figured out that, wow, it's this thing that we've never seen here before. And then nothing was really done about that until a botanist with DNR heard about it back in 2007 and decided she would go out and kind of look and see what she found. And so the original invasion had patches about the size of what I've outlined in yellow here. When they went out to the site of the initial introduction that had been documented, what they saw was basically an understory filled with wavy leaf basket grass. So this is what can happen in about a decade of wavy leaf basket grass going unchecked. So there were a lot of questions initially, and one of the first ones was, how did it get here? And you see this, um, if you just do a Google search for wavy leaf basket grass, you see this come up in a couple of the publications. Um, one of the hypotheses was that one of the, near one of the main introduction sites is an old landfill, and they thought, well, maybe this was an escaped ornamental that got thrown out and has reverted back to kind of the wild type, more aggressive form. Um, and so that was a popular theory for a while. You can, in fact, still buy this. Uh, this was last week. I went shopping for Wavy Leaf online, and I found it in a couple of places. You can buy it on Amazon if you're so inclined. Um, you can see the variegated form is really pretty. It's got these white and green stripes. You can even get a variegated form um, with purple. We see variegated leaves in the field very, very rarely, but we still see them every once in a while. So is our green, sometimes white and purple, Wavy Leaf? just a reverted, more aggressive form of the commonly uh, available variegated form. So some researchers at USDA and APHIS worked on this. They did some genetic work. And what they were able to find is that it's morphologically and genetically different from the variegated form. So what we have is not an escaped reverted houseplant. It's something that came from somewhere else. Um, so the next question is, so where the heck did it come from? And what the APHIS crew did was, um, analyze samples in herbaria from around the country. And what they found, this is a map from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. All the yellow points are wavy leaf presence points. And what they found was the closest match to what we have was a sample that was taken from this region up here in Turkey. So maybe that's where ours came, where ours came from, um, maybe not, but that's probably the best that we can do in terms of the origin of our invasion. Our population, the genetic makeup, most close, closely matches samples collected from this area in Turkey. How it got here, it probably hitchhiked on somebody, and I'll show you why in a little bit. So just a little bit about its distribution. So this is from uh, Bonap, the floor of North America, and um, what you're seeing here is the distribution of the genus Oplosminus in the United States. There's several other Oplosminus species in the U.S., uh, so this map shows all of them, and you can see that as, in addition to our site in Maryland with the uh, invasive, there's also native Oplosminus that are down here in the southeastern United States. 
ours, this is um, taken from USDA plant. So they don't have the uh, sightings that have been recorded for Pennsylvania and Virginia in here. Um, so USDA plants just shows Oplosminus undulatifolius as being present in Maryland. If you look at EDMAPS, and I think I pulled this last week, this is showing the counties that it's been reported and the shading has to do with the number of reports they've had from that particular um, county. So you can see a little bit better the distribution as we know it now from EDMAPS. And this is what uh, EDMAPS, I think, combined with some information they have from the USDA, where they think that it could potentially invade. So questions about the northern limit pretty far up into New England, probably about the middle of the United States, and then some areas where it could potentially um, grow fairly well on the west coast. So while it's localized to Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia now, it could potentially cover a fairly large uh, amount of the U.S. here. This is the range for the native. Um, so I get people sending me pictures of the native um, every once in a while. It tends to be much more compact than the invasive species that we have here in Maryland, and it's not as hairy. So those are kind of the things I look for um, when trying to distinguish the two. So if you're down in Virginia through Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, you may run into the native species. There's also another introduced species that I don't have much um, experience with. This is Oblosminus burmanii, and it's only been reported from Florida. So there are other Oblosminus in the United States, but what we're looking at is just Oblosminus undulatifolius, which is non-native and found so far in Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. So my lab has been doing quite a bit of research on this plant, just trying to figure out basic ecology. Where does it grow? How competitive is it? How easily is it dispersed? Does anything eat it? And then probably of interest to many people here, how do you get rid of it? So I'll just go over some of the results um, that my lab has gotten over the last decade or so. So we're really interested in where it's able to grow. It clearly likes forest understories. What you're seeing here is a site in Patapsco Valley State Park near the site of the initial introduction. And other than the big Japanese barberry in the middle, pretty much everything in the understory is wavy leaf basket grass. One of the things we notice, though, are there are places where it does not grow well. We notice that underneath the beech trees, we tend not to see it. And we notice that wavy leaf does well in the understory, but as soon as you get out into a light gap or a trail or the edge of the forest, the stilt grass tends to take over. And we were really curious why that might be. So our question was, what factors are associated with high wavy leaf cover? Where does it do the best and where does it not grow well? So we did a forest transect study at a variety of sites around Maryland, and we ran transects from the edge of the forest, whether it's a trail or a gap or an edge, um, into the forest 50 meters. And we sampled along these transects, the cover of wavy leaf, and then um, other variables like light, cover of other species, number of beech trees, soil moisture, pretty much the whole gamut that we could think of. What we found is pretty much the main influencing factor is leaf litter. It wasn't light, much to our surprise. I think we had some issues with our study where we didn't get out into the bright light enough. Um, so our study was inconclusive as to light, even though we still only really see it in the shade. In terms of leaf litter, because wavy leaf is an annual, it can grow through, th I mean, wavy leaf is a perennial, sorry, it can grow through thicker amounts of leaf litter than silk grass can, which is an annual. So usually once you get leaf litter over about an inch deep, the silk grass can't germinate through that. They don't have enough seed reserves. Whereas we see um, wavy leaf coming up in plots where the litter is two, three inches deep. So it seems to be the thing that limits the wavy, that limits the silk grass under the forest canopy might be the leaf litter thickness. So it means that there's a lot of forest that really the, the still grass can't inhabit than the wavy leaf can. Light was also a factor. There are places where it is too shady for wavy leaf and we think that might be what's happening under these beech trees because they tend to be a sub canopy. We notice under some really dense shrubs we don't see wavy leaf either. Um, this could also be some sort of allelopathy interaction and we haven't been able to test that yet. Um, if you're looking for wavy leaf, one place that you're not going to find it is out in big gaps like this. It tends to not like really bright light. Um, when we grow it in the greenhouse and don't shade it, it gets all bleached out and doesn't do as well. 
Um, so if you're looking for a wavy leaf, definitely keep your eye on the forest understory and don't worry so much about big openings like this. The other place, curiously enough, where we find invasion starting is at the base of trees. So again, if you're out searching for this, this is one place to keep an eye on. For whatever reason, we tend to see it starting at the base of trees. I don't know if it's animals that are rubbing it off of their fur or birds preening it out of their feathers. Um, it's one of the, the things our lab wants to look at, but we're not quite sure how to attack yet. But the base of trees seems to be where some of these invasions get started. In terms of what other habitats it grows in, we didn't really find any relationship with soil moisture and just in anecdotal evidence of just walking around and looking at this, it tends to grow pretty much anywhere in the understory from really kind of dry hillsides like this here to wetland areas. We'll find it growing up through water in wetlands. So it can handle really, really saturated soil as well as just kind of dry normal forest understory soil. We were curious how competitive it was. So you saw the picture I showed before of wavy leaf as far as the eye can see. So we were curious how it actually manages to do that. So in our transect study, one of the things we did was take all the plots that we surveyed and divide them up into groups based on their species richness. So what you're seeing for the one category, those are plots that just had wavy leaf. So when wavy leaf is the only thing in the plot, its cover is usually about 90%. But as you add more and more species to the plot, the cover of the wavy leaf tends to decrease, whereas plots that are really, really rich only have about 25% wavy leaf cover. So we were curious. This could be a couple, due to a couple of different things. It could be because wavy leaf is really competitive and what we're seeing is it's just simply invading an area and hasn't really outcompeted everything yet, but as it outcompetes more things, it takes up more of the plot. Or it could be that wavy leaf actually isn't a good competitor at all and only grows well in plots where nothing else was there to begin with. So we were curious if we could figure out what's going on here. So we did a greenhouse experiment looking at wavy leaf, that's our Oplosminus undulatifolius, and we competed against stilt grass and then a mix of native grasses that Ernst Conservation Seeds um, uses as what they call their stilt grass smothering mix. So areas where they're restoring places where stilt grass was dominant, uh, we wanted to know how it would work against wavy leaf. So we did this back in 2012. It's finally probably going to get published in Invasive Plant Science and Management um, probably within the next year. So this is our setup. We grew the different species in shallow pots. We had flats with just monocultures of grass and then other flats paired with um, competition. Um, we grew it with under just our open greenhouse and then under shade. What we found is that we didn't see any effect of light when these different species were grown in monoculture. We think part of the reason is our greenhouse was whitewashed, so it wasn't as bright as it could have been. Um, you can see the wavy leaf here, that's going to be the OU down here. Um, grew a little less well under the full sun compared to the shade whereas the microcesium kind of even and the mix grew a little bit better under the sun. Um, but none of, this, none of this was significant. So we still need to work on um, how exactly light affects it and what the thresholds are. When we looked at competition, what you're seeing here is the results of competitive interactions between pairs of species. So this is the response of wavy leaf when microstegium is grown with it, when stilt grass is grown with it. And a negative response means that it did less well, it did worse in the presence of a competitor. And the, the height of the bar, the depth of the bar, is the difference between growing by itself and growing in competition. So you can see wavy leaf is really heavily affected when grown with either stilt grass or the native mix. When you flip it and you look at how microstegium or the mix did when grown with wavy leaf, there really wasn't an effect of really having wavy leaf in the flat. So microstegium and the mix, silkgrass and the mix, had really big effects on wavy leaf in terms of competition. And if you look at the other way around, it's like the wavy leaf wasn't even there. The microstegium or the silkgrass and the native mix didn't really respond to it being there at all. So what this tells us, at least in our greenhouse experiment, is that wavy leaf might actually be a fairly poor competitor and not able to invade plots that are really species rich or have a lot of other species in them already. We still need to do field experiments with this to verify it, but this is what our greenhouse experiments suggest to us. So how in the world do you get this from something that's not a very good competitor? And we think that 
this has to do with how the, the condition of the forest that wavy leaf is invading. And it might only do well in forests that pretty much have no understory because as you can see the browse line up here, the deer have taken out all of its competitors. So that's one of the things that we wanna look at next and that a graduate student from Miami, Ohio University has done is kind of look at the effects of deer crossed with wavy leaf and whether or not it only does well in areas where the deer have eliminated all the competition. So one of the other things we want to kind of look at. One of the reasons we're really worried about this species, other than the fact that it makes these giant carpets in the forest, is that it's really, really good at dispersing. So here's a field of wavy leaf. You can see the inflorescences kind of poking up over the leaves of the grass. Um, it makes this raceme. The raceme is studded with seeds. And unlike a lot of grass species you might be used to in terms of making hooks or barbs, this thing literally makes goo that covers the awns and the glooms that encase the seeds. So when you walk through this, you basically get covered. So you end up looking like that. So you can potentially move thousands of seeds just by walking through a small patch of this and then going somewhere else. So this is one of my undergrads volunteering for this in the field, and this is one of their pets. This is poor Harley, who was a test subject a while ago. So we wanted to know just how much seed could be moved by people and pets and different types of material. So first of all, we needed to figure out how much seed does wavy leaf produce overall. So we went out, we um, had some plots where we clipped biomass, we collected all the seed and had the undergraduates weigh out small batches and count and extrapolate. And we figured out that in about a, a square meter of biomass, these are our three different sites, wavy leaf produces anywhere from 2,000 to about 2,500 up to 3,000 seeds. So it can produce a huge amount of seed in a small amount of space. And that seed is very, very easily dispersed. Um, and this isn't even looking at asexual reproduction. The species also reproduces clonally just by sending out runners and putting out new plants. So a lot of seed potentially produced um, in just a small amount of space by wavy leaf. This is looking at when the seed is produced and how much is produced. So these are my three sites again, the three colors. Uh, and what I had is I had undergrads go out and to different patches of wavy leaf and essentially take a piece of cloth and wave it through the grass and see how much seed got picked up. And you can see that the seed production is variable by year. We had different results in different years. It's variable by site. Woodstock here outperformed all the other sites um, in 2013, but not as much in 2012. Um, and it's variable in time. So usually you start seeing flowers in kind of midsummer and it starts having sticky seed around the beginning of August. I unfortunately don't get good access to undergrads until the semester starts. Um, so we typically worry about spreading seed when we're working in wavy leaf right about middle of September. Um, although we were out doing a project this summer and we were finding sticky wavy leaf seed at a completely different site as early as the beginning of July. So this has a fairly long period when it's in seed and it's able to be spread. We wanted to know how well it germinated. And again, there's a lot of variability here and I'm not sure what's causing it. So the the clumps of bars are the different sites, and then the colors down here are different collection dates, and then we just look to see how well those different batches of seeds collected at different um, locations and points in time germinated. Um, the, the seed collected fairly early in the summer has much lower germination rate, but once you get higher, seed collected in October and November um, can have upwards of 80% germination. So actually very, very high germination. Uh, for a grass species. So it makes a lot of seed. The seed that it makes tends to germinate very well and it's really good at dispersing. So we looked at different types of cloth. Um, as you would expect, things that aren't very fuzzy as a technical term, um, don't pick up a huge amount of seed. So this is really important in terms of what to wear if you have to work in it and not spread it. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, my volunteers who wore denim and fleece ended up on, we wrapped cloth around their lower leg. And after just walking through wavy leaf for 30 seconds, you got between 300 and 800 seeds on your leg. So a, quite a lot of seed can be picked up just walking through it for a short period of time. 
We wanted to know how long the seed stayed stuck. So the idea was, so you get it on your pants or your shoes and you chuck them in the closet and you go out later at some point, are you gonna bring the, bring the seed with you? The answer is probably yes. So here's our four types of cloth again. So denim, fleece, nylon, and twill. Um, nylon, nylon and twill are the more smooth ones and the denim and fleece are the, the ones that it sticks to more easily. What we did is take all those cloths that my undergraduates had wrapped around their legs as they walked through wavy leaf and we put them away in pieces of newspaper and then took them out and shook them off after a set number of hours. So when we shook those, the cloths off right after they were in the field, um, this is the percentage of here, adhered seed removed. So denim and fleece, basically no seed falls off. Nylon and twill, a tiny bit of the adhered seed falls off. So right away, it's stuck pretty good. And it stays stuck. So it doesn't matter if you let it sit for an hour or for seven days, after that, you're only going to, just by shaking it, get maybe 10% of the seeds to come off. You have to really physically brush them off of something like denim and fleece. Nylon and twill, it comes off a little bit easier, but you're still only gonna remove maybe half of the seeds from that piece of cloth just by kind of shaking it off. So the seed can stay adhered to cloth for a pretty long time. Um, we want to understand how people's pets might pick it up. So these, again, more test subjects. This is my dog, Daphne. This is poor Harley. Uh, we ran them through wavy leaf seed or wavy leaf patches and looked to see how much seed we got out of their fur. This, again, is Harley, our poor lab, um, our golden retriever. And he picked up 12,000 seeds just running through 50 meters of wavy leaf. So pets are a gigantic disperser of this. Um, Daphne, my black lab that has a fairly smooth coat, 2,000 seeds, and the same with the other more smooth coated dogs. So people running their pets through this in the fall, I think are a big disperser of how this grass gets from place to place. We wanted to know how well deer could disperse it. So did it even stick to deer fur at all? Um, the deer are far less cooperative than the dogs. So we ended up going to a processor and getting legs. He thought we were crazy. Um, we walked the legs through the grass and it turns out just on the lower leg of the deer, it gets about, an, uh, about 190, 200 seeds stuck to it. So deer walking through this, laying down in it, moving on can be really important dispersers. And deer trails is where we find a lot of the wavy leaf starting. Whenever I give this talk to people in Virginia, they always ask about bears. You guys are on your own. We're not doing bears. I imagine bears can disperse it. I have no data to support that. So what does this mean for someone who's trying to keep this out of their area? Where do you start to look for it? The first place you look is trails. This is gonna come in with people and pets who have been somewhere else that have wavy leaf and haven't cleaned off their gear or their shoes. So look for it on the edge of trails is the first place. Look for it where people first get out of their cars and do things like put on their boots that have been in wavy leaf a week ago. So look at things like um, trailheads. Look at places where people put down their stuff. If you've got a backpack or a hip pack or something and you put it down in a wavy leaf patch to take a rest, odds are you're gonna put it back on, there'll still be seeds. You'll go somewhere else, put it back down and spread some wavy leaf. One of the places where it's um, first got discovered in Maryland where it's densest is actually in a really popular disc golf course. Um, and the folks at Pennsylvania DNR knew this and they decided they would go and survey all of their disc golf courses and that's where they found it. So again, thinking of where people or how people might pick this up at one place and then deposit it somewhere else, that's where you're gonna wanna look first. So along trails, trailheads and where people put gear down or bring gear. Um, we wanted to understand how well it does in water. So remember I said that we tend to find it germinating in wetlands. I had a student look at putting seeds in water for a set number of weeks. And we found that even after having the seeds in water for a month of our samples of 10 seed each, over half of them still germinated. So this can definitely handle staying in water. Um, it can be water dispersed, not a whole lot, but it definitely can move around in streams as well. So don't don't discount really wet areas from areas where wavy leaf could potentially grow. I collaborated with a professor at Hood College who is an entomologist and they were really interested in what actually lives in this. So a lot of times 
um, one of the hypotheses for why an invasive species is able to come in and take over an area is because it's left its natural enemies behind. It doesn't really have anything in its native range that eats it, therefore giving it kind of a competitive edge over other native species. Um, if this is the case, what we're basically doing is taking the bottom, the foundation of the food chain and converting it into something that nothing eats. So you can imagine the ramifications that that might have for higher trophic levels. So the first thing we wanted to figure out is does anything live in it and does anything eat it? Um, so this is from Tammy Heiselmeyer. This was her master's project. And what she did was have plots in areas that are uninvaded and areas that were invaded. And she looked at invertebrate richness, diversity, and evenness. And what she found was that there wasn't really a difference. Um, so this is pitfall trap data. And so things that are running around in the leaf litter underneath the wavy leaf or in the uninvaded areas. She didn't really find a difference in richness, diversity, or evenness. In terms of amounts of individuals, when we broke it down by species, we did find some differences. So what we found was that in the invaded areas, so with wavy leaf, we caught more things like cockroaches, ground beetles, and rove beetles. And we caught less of things like cave crickets, scarab beetles, and fungus gnats. And we think that this has more to do with the environment of the uninvaded plot rather than the wavy leaf itself. So remember, we talked about the fact that one of the reasons wavy leaf might be really competitive and able to form these monocultures is it might be invading areas where nothing else really grows because of the high deer pressure. And in fact, this was the setup for this um, invertebrate experiment. Our uninvaded areas looked pretty much like this, pretty much an empty understory. In the area of Maryland where we live, there's not a lot of other forests that look better than this, unfortunately. Um, and so we think that what happened, that's what have, uh, excuse me, that what is happening is for things like beetles and roaches and things like that, that might need some cover to keep in moisture, wavy leaf actually does a fairly good job. It's at the point where it's kind of better than nothing for these insects. Um, would they do better if you had an understory filled with native species? They very well might, but we don't have anywhere like that to really be able to test that hypothesis. We wanted to know if anything really eats it. So Tammy put out little cages and caged off areas of wavy leaf so that nothing else could really get to it. And we looked at damage on wavy leaf in caged and open areas. And so what you're seeing down here are the different types of damage that Tammy looked for. Um, and you're looking at the damage incidences per leaf for the caged, that's the gray and the open is the white. And you can see that the open has more incidence of damage, but there's not very many overall and they're not very different from the caged. So what we took away from this is that really there's not a lot of things that are eating this. Punctures were by far the, by far the most common type of damage. And this might just be insects coming to the wavy leaf and kind of tasting it, but not really eating it. Um, oops, sorry. So the maximum surface area, the maximum leaf surface area that we found that had damage was between 15 to 21%. And that's our five absolute most damaged leaves out of the whole sample of hundreds of leaves. The majority of leaves had fewer than 25 incid incidences of damage and most of them were these little tiny punctures. So what we take, took away from that is there's really not a lot that's eating this. There might be things living it, in it, but not a lot that's really feeding on it. We do, however, see some incidence of damage after the wavy leaf has already set seed. So this is pretty common in the fall. This we think is some sort of leaf miner that gets in here and eats out kind of the inside of the leaf. But this happens well into the fall after it's flowered and seeded. So we don't think that this type of damage is something that's really gonna affect the fitness of the plant. It's not something that might be appropriate for any sort of biocontrol or anything like that. Um, so while we do see this type of dam, this feeding damage, we're not really seeing any sort of feeding damage that would affect the ability of the plant to survive and reproduce. A lot of people want to know if deer eat it. We haven't tested it explicitly by trying to force feed deer wavy leaf, um, but we never see any incidence of any sort of browse or grazing damage. We don't see any sort of damage that we could attribute to deer. Most of the wavy leaf we see in the field, except for very late in the fall where we see these mines, is completely unblemished. Um, so it doesn't really look like much of anything eats it. We have some really preliminary projects that we're kind of just starting. Um, so this is a collaboration with Dr. Carrie Wu at the University of Richmond. 
and we're starting to work on some population genetics to try and determine how this was introduced, understand that a little bit better, and see if we can understand how it's being spread. And so what we're doing is we're um, using DNA sequencing to identify different populations to determine if this was one introduction event or several. And then if we can figure out where the main sources of wave relief are for all these satellite invasions, if they're coming out of one or a few places, or if it's being moved around from lots of other places. Um, we can also test our wavy leaf, the genetic diversity that we see in the field, um, with herbarium specimens from the original population um, that we got in Maryland and see if we can get a sense of if we're adding genetic diversity. The other thing that we wanted to know was how similar our introduced species was to the native that I showed you that has those populations down south. So this is really preliminary. We haven't had a chance to do much like this. Here's the original 1996 and 97 populations up here, the edge of Baltimore County in Maryland. Oh, this is just to show you kind of how it spread. Sorry, I forgot the order here. So this is kind of a story of how this has moved through the Maryland area and what we're trying to understand here. So like I said, the stars here are the original areas where we found it in 1996 and 97. We don't know how long it had been there before then. Oops. We started getting data um, added to EdMaps and iNaturalist in 2009. So this data set are data that was collected prior to 2009 and that was added in a batch to EdMaps. So we don't have concrete dates for the red dots here, but you can see mainly around Maryland, some areas in Washington, DC, and then down here in Shenandoah National Park, along the Appalachian Trail. Fast forward to 2011. So these are again data from both EdMaps and iNaturalist just parceled out by time. You can see a spread up the Appalachian Trail, other places in Maryland and DC. Fast forward to 2015, a lot more areas. Fast forward to 2017, you're starting to see it pop up now in Pennsylvania. And then this is the last set of data that I downloaded last week from EdMaps and iNaturalist. This is everything through last week uh, for, through 2019. So you can see it's got a couple main corridors where it's spreading. Uh, it seems like the main populations are here in Baltimore, some in Washington, DC, and Shenandoah. So we wanted to see if we could use information about genetic diversity and identity to kind of understand how the grass is moving. One of the first things that Carrie did was send some students down to North and South Carolina to, um, so to sample some of the native populations. And she was able to confirm that what we have is indeed different from the native. We have something that's totally and completely a different species. Um, so we know that for sure now. We also know based on comparing uh, wavy leaf from the inter an original introduction site, we looked at its genetic diversity and then we looked at genetic diversity from a site up in Baltimore on the Mingo Forks Trail and the gunpowder, and then down in Front Royal in that first Shenandoah site that I showed you. And what we found was the original invasion population has a higher diversity, genetic diversity. It has an average of more alleles per locus, so kind of flavors of genes per part on the chromosome. Um, it's higher than the Mingo Forks and the Front Royal populations. And we also found that the subset that the Mingo Forks and the Front Royal populations have different subsets of alleles, but all of those are found in the original invasion. So that supports their idea that this might have been the original introduction site and we're getting individual dispersal events out to these other areas that are moving very small amounts of seed that then give rise to a new population. So we're gonna keep working on that and see where that takes us. The last thing that we're working on right now is this is a master's project at Towson. This is one of my students, and he's really interested in the soil microbial community and whether or not that's affected by wavy leaf basket grass. Um, there's been other research that shows that species like stiltgrass and garlic mustard have very big impacts on the identity of things like soil fungi and bacteria that associate with the roots of a lot of um, plant species and changing the identity of these can change things like nitrogen cycling and availability, availability of nutrients. So we wanted to see if there was any difference in soil microbiomes between sites with wavy leaf and sites without wavy leaf. So we got done sampling for that over this summer. And the first thing that he did 
is use what are called eco-plates. And what this is, it's a, a plate with 36 different sources of carbon. Um, you extract a solution from the soil that you've collected, you spread that out over, over the plate. And if bacteria in that solution use one of those sources, those sources of carbon, um, that little well turns a different color. So you're able to see kind of what the bacteria are doing it from these different sites. Um, the data that I'm showing you here is hot off the press. This was last week. Um, this is what's called an ordination and it looks kind of scary, but all it's showing you is each dot is a site for his project. It's one of his plots. And um, the data contained in each of those, these dots are the wells that lit up due to bacteria eating these um, carbon compounds. And so dots that are closer together here have a similar bacterial composition or the bacteria are using similar carbon sources than dots that are farther apart. So if there was a really different bacterial community under the wavy leaf versus in other plots, you'd see these two different dot colors be completely separate on the graph. So one is our control, our non-wavy leaf sites, and the twos are the wavy leaf sites. And here you can see they're mixed really well together. So we're not seeing, at least for this type of analysis, a big difference in terms of the soil microbiome under wavy leaf versus outside of wavy leaf. So it doesn't really seem at this preliminary stage to be affecting the soil microbiome. The next step here is to extract DNA and do sequencing and look and see exact species or at least taxonomic groups of fungi and bacteria and see if we see differences there. So he's got a ways to go on this project. Um, but I just wanted to share this for, with you right now in a very preliminary way. We don't see big effects on soil microbiome here, but there's probably a lot more to that story. So what do we do about this? Um, really, we need help with documentation and control. So the only way we get funding to study this grass is to show that it is a problem and people want information about it. Um, there's three different ways that people that I know of are collecting data. Um, a lot of the data that I showed you was from the Mid-Atlantic Early Detection Network, so MADEN, which is a part of EDMAPS. Um, that's an app that you can download and really easily take points in the field. Uh, it allows you to um, take both presence points and absence points, which can be really important. And it also allows you to note whether or not the site has been treated. So if you found it and pulled it, still give us a point, let us know that it was there and you were able to take care of it. iNaturalist is also a great way to collect points on wavy leaf. Um, there's lots of good data there. Um, please contribute, continue to contribute data there if you have been. And then Pennsylvania has been using IMAP Invasives, a different platform to track their wavy leaf. So depending on where you are in the United States, um, really any of these can work for you. But having those data are really important. Being able to see where this is moving, how it's moving, and how big of a problem it is, is really critical to being able to get funding to study this grass further. What do you do about this? Um, so one of the things we're telling people is don't attempt to control it after the plants have st set seed. If it's sticky, just stay out of it. Um, you'll just end up spreading it. We know that treatments have to be repeated at each site for at least three years. We haven't been able to study out past that. Um, but we know that at least three years of follow-up is needed. We know that seeds can germinate throughout the year. So if you treat it early in the spring, you'll get new germinants throughout the summer. Um, plants can produce seed in the very first year as well. Um, seed viability is really high, germination is really high, but we don't know how long the seed remains viable in the soil. That's one of the things that we start, we wanna start looking at. And like I said before, if you're conducting, um, if you're looking for wave relief, focus on roads. If you're conducting control for wave relief and you have limited resources, focus on areas where people are most likely to pick this up. Edges of trails, edges of roads, near parking lots, things like that. How do you kill it? Uh, hand pulling can be really effective in small patches. It's not really great for big areas. Um, the roots can re-sprout, so you really need to make sure you get the root system. Um, I like hand weeding for volunteer events for raising awareness, but not necessarily really effective control. You've got to go back and kind of go over it again and make sure they got everything. And then again, follow-up is really critical to catch the re-sprouts. If you're doing herbicide control, glyphosate is really good at killing it. Um, so is clethodin if you can afford the more expensive um, grass selective herbicide. Um, both are very effective. Um, it's best, this is from Mark Fry at, uh, at NPS and also um, from the Virginia DCR. What they suggest is 
doing a first treatment really early in the growing season. So late May, early June, the grass doesn't come up much before about the beginning of May. Um, what this does is it's the silk grass is less than it allows you to get better coverage on the wavy leaf. Follow that up in six weeks with another treatment. So this gets those seedlings that germinate since you've treated it the first time um, and it gives you an opportunity to miss any plants that you to get any plants you missed in the first treatment. So glyphosate is is really effective with this. So is clethanin. How do you prevent the spread? Um, so material that is more smooth picks up a lot less wavy leaf. So when we have to go into the patches when they're in seed, we wear rain boots and rain pants. What we can do is then when we get back to the parking lot or get out of the wavy leaf patch, we can take those off throw them in a garbage bag and they don't get seed all over our car or over anything else. So that's what we've started doing. Um, do not get this in your shoelaces. It is awful to get out. Um, if you do get it on your clothes, um, lint rollers and duct tape are really effective. That's our high tech wavy leaf removal gear right there. Um, make sure you clean your gear. It sticks to backpacks. It sticks to absolutely anything. It probably sticks to vehicle tires. You can spread it from site to site that way. Um, so again, if you're going to have to be in this, wear something that is very smooth where the seed won't stick very well and that you can take off and contain very quickly. Um, like I said, I'm happy to help with ID. If you think you've got it and you're not sure, feel free to shoot me a picture. Um, I've got links here for more information uh, from Maryland and Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, I know this presentation gets posted up on YouTube, um, but I've also got a, a bit.ly link to it too if you want access to it that way. Um, you can reach it then. And with that, I guess I'll open it up for questions. Great. Thank you, Vanessa. That was great information um, for us. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat box. Okay. Um, viewers, please continue to enter those questions um, in chat and uh, I will pose them to Vanessa um, as we go along. So let's, let's go ahead and jump in here. Um, there's some curiosity about whether there might be a correlation or a relationship between wavy leaf basket grass and non-native earthworms. Do you know of any research or do you have any kind of um, anecdotal information about that? We don't know. And that's something I would love to study, but no, we don't know anything about that yet. Okay. Um, and then how about competition with woody plants, especially you know, some of the more uh, desirable tree species, oaks, maples, hickory, Again, we don't know, and that's one of the things that's probably next on my list, is to try and do some plantings with woody seedlings and look to see how wavy leaf competition affects their ability to get going. But yeah, there's so much about this we just don't know. And along with that, um, there's some curiosity about whether deer exclosure studies might be useful to look at the impacts that wavy leaf grass alone would have on um, woody species uh, germination, um, forest regeneration. Do right. you have any? Do you know of any plans to do that? So Anna Bowen at University of Ohio, Miami, Ohio, just finished up her PhD research doing a deer exclosure study. So she's analyzing data probably as we speak, working on that. Um, so I don't know the results of that yet. Um, hers were rather small deer exclosures and she only followed them for a couple years. Um, I'd love to have larger deer exclosure studies, but nobody that I know of has those data or has done that yet. Uh, all right, um, and now moving on towards to control methods. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any potential biocontrol agents that could be con are in consideration or? or no, there's nothing being considered right now that I know of. Okay, um, and how about response to fire? There, really early on, Maryland DNR did some flame weeding tests with that. Um, I want to say that it was effective, but not as effective as the Roundup and the Clethanin. Okay. And then the, there was a question about using goat herds to um, maybe, if, if they don't completely eradicate, they can maybe weaken populations. Have you seen? I've not heard of goats being used on this. We have goats come to Towson University's campus to do some other non-native control. Um, and the goat herder is terrified of spreading wavy leaf seed. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, we have a, a, another question about um, uh, the um, Curtellus species. Um, that's a it, uh, it's a somewhat uncommon native in southern Arkansas. Um, it looks like 
um, the undulate latifolius is larger with larger leaves. Is that is that accurate, or is there another way to distinguish between those two species that you know of? Right. So distinguishing between the native, the Oplosminus hertelis ceteris, and then our undulate folius, um, the main way that I do that is the the native, the one that's native down south, tends to be more compact and less hairy. Um, okay. Other than that, they're fairly hard to tell apart. I've seen enough of it that I'm fairly confident I can tell them apart. Um, okay. But that's what I look for is kind of the compactness and how, how fuzzy it is. Okay, so it's kind of a relative relative yeah. characteristic yeah. question. There's, there's nothing surefire to be able to separate them that I know of, visually okay. at least. Okay, that's good to know. Um, we have another question about uh, chemical control. Um, this viewer says Roundup can be used in the early season but there's another product that's better for late season and it looks like they're just looking for a reminder of what that product might be called. Do you know? No, which I one don't. Be? Okay. Um, another question about ID, jumping around here a little bit. Um, is there a fact sheet um, that could be taken into the field? Like uh, I think the US Forest Service does some invasive species fact sheets um, that could be used as an ID guide. Yeah, so the links that I've got on the page that's up now, if people can still see that, I think all of those have some sort of ID tips and compare and contrast with some of the species that I showed you in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and is the native, are the native um, basket grass species as invasive as this non-native one, the, the, the native um, North American species that are present uh, more in the southern United States? No, not nearly. In fact, in some areas, they're actually fairly rare and hard to find, and we're not sure why. Okay. Do you know of any studies coming up or um, being proposed that could look at that? No. And the problem is there's no funding for any of this. I mean, basically all that I've showed you, we've managed to do on the cheap with undergrads, and it's been really difficult to get any sort of funding to do any sort of large projects with this. Okay. Um, just reading through some more of the questions here. Um, what? One person asked whether the Gulf Coast states are included in EDMAPS. So EDMAPS is, as far as my understanding is that EDMAPS is um, national and then there's regional apps that people can add data using. So I, the Gulf Coast states might have their own um, app, like Maiden is for the Mid-Atlantic. I, I don't know if the Gulf Coast has something separate. Okay. Um, some folks are looking at um, resources more own audiences, uh, including before and after shots of invaded um, wavy leaf basket grass dominated um, sites. And then also they're looking for more photos of pets with um, the wavy leaf basket grass seeds. <laughs> I'm happy to share all of my photos. If people want photos, just send me an email and I'll send you a link to my Dropbox folder that's got all the shareable things in it. Okay. I'm happy to share photos. Great. We have about six more minutes. Let's see what else is popping up here. Um, so um, someone's sharing some preliminary results. Um, deer fencing and hand weeding with glyphosate and clethodim treatments. Um, the deer fencing did not have a significant effect on wavy leaf cover density or woody tree seedling density. Um, Let's go so that, to Anna. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to respond further to that? Um, those are the only data that we know about. Yeah, I mean, and I, when I was at the natural areas meeting, um, there was another talk that looked at effects of deer exposures overall. And one of the things they found was that you don't get very much response at all to anything if you're under canopy and light makes a big difference. So I don't know if we're not seeing any responses because the wavy leaf doesn't matter or because there's, we're under a closed canopy and we wouldn't see a response anyway. So there's, there's lots of different things we still need to do there. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're having some more questions about Japanese slowgrass as well. And I realize that's not the main focus of the presentation, but in particular, the native seed mix from Ernst Seed and Meadville, Pennsylvania, um, does it, effectively exclude Japanese silkgrass based on your experiments? I don't know. Okay. I mean, it was competitive against the silkgrass. It didn't knock it down completely, um, but we only did it for, you know, a few months in the greenhouse as well. Okay. 
Um, so definitely contact Ernst about that. They would know more. Okay, great. Um, so there's, there's uh, some more concern about, again, range limits. And I know that you had a pre uh, slide earlier in your presentation. Can you, can you maybe go back to that, the potential range limit yeah, or? If I can do this without messing it up. Boom, 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 boom. That. Yep. That slide. Great. So yep. I just found this on EdMaps. I'm not sure where they got these data, but I know that the USDA did a weed risk assessment that came out in 2012 that also has a range limit map that matches this fairly closely. Okay. And I think as part of Anna's work, she did some, um, some modeling to look at range limits as well. So that will hopefully be coming out soon, but I don't remember the results there. Okay, and that's um, Anna Bowen. Um, mm -hmm. we, we might uh, be in touch with Anna and maybe um, see if we can get some information from her to include in the video of sure. the webinar. Um, sounds like she had some interesting results. Um, yep, yeah, so there's still, there's still questions coming in. Um, I wish I had more answers. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've given us good information. Um, so uh, one question is, it doesn't sound like we know much about the negative impacts of wavy leaf basket grass because there's this overlap with um, very high density deer browse pressure. Um, do you want to respond to that? I think that's one of the reasons why it's hard to tease it apart in the field. Um, because most of the areas where it's invaded, the rest of the area has really high deer pressure. Um, I know that there are some places like uh, Middle Patuxent Environmental Area has wavy leaf and they've also been doing managed hunts and have managed to get their deer density down. Um, so one of the things to potentially look at is, is the behavior of wavy leaf different there, but we haven't been able to do anything like that. Okay. All right. Um, well, this has been great information. It generated a lot of questions at the end of your, your presentation and a lot of comments. Um, it looks like folks are on the lookout for wavy leaf basket grass for sure. Um, Fantastic. So that is... Report it when you see it. Pull it as soon as you find it. Um, and could you, take us, could you also take us back to your final slide so that people can see your contact information one more time? There you go. Great, thank you. So I just I just want to thank Vanessa again for uh, the great information that she provided us, including some really very new research results. Um, thank you to everyone who attended the webinar live for your questions. Um, you can reach Vanessa directly um, through the email address on the screen, or you can contact the Natural Areas Association and we'll put you in touch. Just a reminder for folks who are interested in receiving one category one CFE credit from the Society of American Foresters, please email me with your state forester license or uh, uh, registration number. My email address one more time is spears at naturalareas.org. So thank you, Vanessa. Thank you everybody for attending and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Sarah.